Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, and thank you, Amy, for emceeing. Um, I'm Sam Davis. I'm board director for District 1. And um, I just appreciate everyone taking the time. I know that budget issues can be very complex and also can be very emotional. Um, and people often say that budgets are an expression of our values. And that's true to some extent, although budgets are also constrained by legal requirements and historical precedent and lots of external systems. And so too often our budgets don't reflect our values. And so part of what we're trying to do is to push so that our budgets do better reflect our values. Um, and I want to acknowledge also just what a difficult moment this is, what a difficult year this is for, uh, and so it's very difficult to be having a conversation about budget reductions when we know school sites are so short staffed because of uh, substitute shortages and the COVID requirements and just the stress of coming back to in-person learning. And so just please, I hope everyone is expressing great gratitude to all of the teachers, all of the school staff, all the administration that are helping to keep our schools going right now. And um, it is a difficult conversation that we were able to somewhat finesse last year, um, thanks to the relief funds. And it's, it's really difficult that this year we do, because of the financial situation, have to have this conversation. Um, but I do appreciate that, that we, oh, can you go to the next slide, please, Troy? That was supposed to be the, um, the slide for this one. I do appreciate that, that people are sharing this moment with us. Um, okay, next slide. So I always like to start this conversation with the bigger context that, you know, uh, California is a very, very wealthy state. And yet, even though it's climbed up somewhat from being in the basement where it used to be in the 40s out of the 50 states and per people funding, now it's up at number 30 out of the 50 states, which is still nowhere near good enough. You see a lot of the, um, states with similar uh, high cost of living that fund education at a much higher level than our state does. And that's due to loopholes in property taxes, in income taxes. We see very wealthy individuals leaving California for Texas so that they don't have to pay income taxes. Um, and you know, Prop 15 that almost passed last year, which would have closed a loophole on commercial property taxes and would have raised $12 billion a year um, statewide for education. And yet even so that's less than Elon Musk made in a single day recently. And so again, we see that there are values informing how much budget we have, but they aren't necessarily our values because uh, we should be taxing the very wealthy in order to serve our students better. Uh, next slide, please. And so I just wanted to highlight some of the other causes besides you know, the inadequate taxing of the great wealth of our, our state um, that are pushing Oakland into uh, financial problems. And one is that there is declining enrollment in Oakland. It was steady for a number of years, but then in the past um, four years, it has declined. And oh yeah, I, I will share the, the slides um, in a few minutes if people wanna see them. Um, but, uh, but there is, you know, it's partially the pandemic has definitely, uh, reduced enrollment, and it's also competition with charter schools, neighboring districts, and private schools has impacted our enrollment in Oakland. Uh, but we are funded based on attendance, and so as our enrollment declines, it does really have a big impact on our, on our revenue. And then the other, another major factor is, uh, you know, equity. We believe strongly in equity, and that means we spend more on some students than on others that that where, where resources are needed to better educate students. And that includes many groups of very high needs, such as students with disabilities, newcomers, students in alternative education, and other groups. And Oakland has committed to serving more of those students than have many other competing systems. Um, and despite the passage of LCFF, we are not funded at the level of the need that, that is necessary to serve those students. Um, and then I wanted to really point out the, the biggest immediate issue is that we need to increase salaries in Oakland to attract and retain employees. Uh, we've seen how hard it has been this year to hire, especially custodians, nutrition services, uh, culture keepers, STIP subs, uh, teachers in general have been very hard to hire because our salaries are lower than um, many adjacent districts. And so we have to increase salaries and 
because legally we have to balance our budget. So there's no way to create the space in the budget to pay people better unless we reduce other expenses. And so when you hear people say, well, how could we be reducing the budget in a year where there's such staffing shortages, it's actually exactly why we have to make budget reductions is in order to address the issue of staffing shortages, we need to be able to offer higher salaries, we need to be able to pay people more. So that means we need to do budget reduction. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there because I definitely want to um, spend most of the time hearing from Lisa Grant Dawson, our chief business officer, and Troy Christmas, who's uh, our financial wizard, um, I'd like to call him. And uh, so I'll pass it over to Lisa from here. And actually, sorry, um, uh, Director, Vice President Davis, if we could check on interpretation again. Sure thing. Andres, do you want to ask? Thank you for putting in the chat. Can you ask out loud too if anybody doesn't, if anybody needs it? Yes, of course. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Andrés de la Torre. Nada más estamos revisando si alguien necesita traducción al español. Si alguien necesita traducción al español, levante su mano o póngalo en el chat, por favor, para poder activar. Okay, I don't see anyone right now, Andres. We'll have you kind of hang out until six o'clock and then we'll see if we need it. So okay. um, over to you, Lisa. Good evening, everyone. Director Davis, thank you so much for hosting. Um, apologize for the background noise, but I think we've all gotten accustomed uh, to that. That's my daughter's little dog. I'm actually in Columbus, Ohio, uh, visiting her for a couple of days. And so uh, hopefully he'll stop barking any moment. But my name is Lisa Grant Dawson, and uh, I am the district chief business officer. I'm very happy and pleased to be here with my colleague, Troy Christmas. And thank you, Jody Talkington, for um, the support. Um, so Troy, we can go to the next slide. Okay, is that is it the noise too, too loud? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Amy, for being the first person to shake your head no. <laughs> okay, so what we talked about, this portions of this presentation in full were um, shared with the board on November 3rd. Um, so if you are uh, so interested in uh, watching that video, you go to Legistar, you can see the full presentation, but we're going to give you just some context back to what um, Vice President Davis opened with about why we're here. Um, so I call this um, season and timeline not one of budget um, re re cuts or budget reductions. That's been our trend. Um, what we're going to talk about with some of these slides is what's been happening and evolving over time and what also has been um, an opportunity for us with the advent of the local control funding formula and some things that we need to do um, more diligently. So this slide specifically shows the blue line being our enrollment and then the orange line being our ADA. And this is something that I've raised in several different um, cycles to help with the understanding about we are funded based on enrollment. Um, I'm sorry, we are, we plan based on enrollment, which is the blue line, and we're funded on ADA. Troy, is that um, our little square still there? It is not on this slide for some reason. I don't know what this, maybe an earlier version. Oh, okay. So um, there's a slide in, on the original deck, and uh, ADA is average daily attendance. And so the way school districts are funded, is that we project and we plan based on enrollment. How many students do we project that we're going to have district-wide and by site and program? But we are funded by the average daily attendance. So how many students on average in the course of a year during a specific period of time attend school? And so we take a dip in attendance <clears throat> in the fall and then we take a dip in attendance in the spring and then the state actually funds us based on attendance. So what you can see here, the first column and hopefully everyone can see it. Troy, I'm not sure if we can zoom in just a bit we started with 2012-13, and the reason why we started with that year is because that is the last year um, that our funding mechanism, that which was called a revenue limit, existed. Revenue limit was the state's way of funding schools that at that time was very simple in the sense of, oh, we're going to just give you one amount per student 
for the course of um, their matriculation. And each year we will add a COLA or cost of living adjustment to that one rate. Now, charter schools, on the other hand, um, started with this tiered rate by grade span. So in 2013-14, when the local control funding formula was implemented, which was also accompanied in 2014-15 by the local control accountability plan, it started to fund us based on the grade span of the students. So you'd have TK23, four through six, seven, eight, and nine, 12. And it recognized that the amount of investment of a primary grade student um, should be lower than that of a high school student based on the number of courses, uh, the number of periods that they're attending, and they're older and require much more investment. And so we started to see this tiered rate and it began to fund us differently, which we're going to get to a slide that, that reflects that. But when we look at our history, our enrollment was increasing 2012-13, all the way to that fourth bullet, 2013-14. Then in 2016-17, we took a dip, it came back up and then began to decline. Meanwhile, the spacing between the blue and the orange line on average is 94%. So approximately 94% of our students attend school on a consistent basis. So remember we plan based on enrollment and then we're funded by attendance. And so when we begin to see um, in 2016, 17, which is the fifth bullet over, we began to see a change in our attendance. And we saw that change occur again in 17, 18. 1819 was the year the district uh, experienced a strike with OEA. And so we saw a dip in attendance then. So we would call that an anomaly, but it, look at how it took us um, quite a bit of effort in 1920, the year after, and we still did not achieve the rate of attendance that we were at with 1718. Meanwhile, look at what's happening with the blue line. We're still seeing enrollment declines. Well, how do we factor enrollment? Why this is so important, I wanna spend some time on this slide. Yes, it's based on the population um, of your um, city or community in which your district is serving. Yes, it's based on how many families are coming into um, your particular city or community or is your community aging out? Do you see, and this is where you have to look at your city demographic data um, in addition to birth rates, which really inform that. Um, but that's just not students that live in Oakland proper. You may have other students that live in other cities um, that um, also are coming into the district. And so we're seeing these changes happening. And then when we look at the next slide, this particular slide shows financially and then by attendance where we collide. So let's go back to the left where we talk about 2012-13, so before local control funding formula, which was designed to give California schools more money. And it was planned that over an eight year period of time, we would see increases in the, the amount per student that we would earn. So that was a great thing. So the opportunity for us to have done that was to be able to invest those resources um, into our schools properly. And as we get to a few more slides, we'll see, we'll show you what also occurred. So the top orange line is our attendance. So we just talked on the first same orange line. And so you'd see this same trend happening where attendance was looking pretty consistent, stable, and then it starts to decline. But look at the bottom orange line. That's how much on average per student we were earning. So in 12-13, we were earning $17,500 per student or $17,006. Um, and then, Troy, are you able to zoom in just a little bit? Just so, yep. If you hit control plus, it'll, or minus, it may be on yours. It'll, ooh, ooh, we'll go back, sorry. It should make it bigger. And I think the link doesn't make it any mode. larger in presentation mode. Oh, because it's in presentation. Okay, not in share mode. Okay, and, and, and Ms. Talkington also put the presentation um, in the slide. So you see us jump from 17, 
1,600 per student up to in that first year of LCFF local control funding formula implementation, 26,000 per student, the next year 29. Then we're passing into the 30s. But what happened in 16, 17? Wait, our ADA is declining though the revenue is growing. So what began to happen was our revenue was growing, not because attendance was growing, not because their enrollment was growing, but because the financial factors of how that eight year implementation was supposed to occur was happening. And you could see that art grow. But by the time we get to that 18, 19 year, which again, the district was able to put in a waiver to earn back the difference uh, of, of the ADA that they lost based on that strike. So that's something legislation does help you do when there's um, emergency situations, a strike, a fire, a flood, or anything that can impact the district. There are waivers that you can put in. Um, and if applicable, then you're able to not lose resources. But at the same time, you're starting to see our enrollment cross that line in 16, 17, I mean, attendance and go down. But yet we still were earning more money per pupil, but it started to slow down. Why? Because attendance was dropping. And the allocations each year that we received could no longer absorb the loss of attendance. And so now we're seeing that our revenue per student is declining by the year. So that's the important component of this particular slide. And it shows you how LCFF grew, but it grew based on the ADA, I mean, based on the rate increases. It wasn't because we earned it because our attendance was growing and therefore uh, we were able to earn more revenue. Next slide, please. Okay, so when we talk about why our expenditures growing up, we are an employer. In school districts, 85% average of your expenditures are people. We're a people business. We, we, we support little to, to growing uh, people in their matriculation, uh, TK-12, and we are grateful. Um, in addition to that, to have an adult program and preschool programs. Um, that are not funded the same way, but ultimately that's the suite of services and the age range of students that we support. But as an employer, we have to compensate our employees. Um, our pension obligations are based on um, the California um, uh, Retirement System for Teachers um, and other certificated, meaning those who have an instructional um, component and certification um, that's required for their position or classified employees who don't require the same certification. And so with that, those obligations go up. And every time there's an increase in revenue, seems interesting how the, the, the retirement rates grow, grow, but it is also because the cost of living changes. And so with those costs of living, we, there's an investment for our um, professionals to be able to have a retirement income. So that's an obligation of the district. Yes, the employee pays a share of that, but the employer pays a, a, a significant share, which we should, because that's again, how we value um, our um, employees who invest in our communities. And so um, with that, we also have increased contributions to restricted programs. What's a contribution? There are certain programs, uh, for instance, um, ongoing major maintenance. You may hear another word used called routine restricted maintenance, the general fund. So we have multiple funds in the district. We primarily are talking about the general fund is required to set aside 3% of its total expenditures to support and maintain its facilities. That's one resource that supports, well, how do we support the actual brick and mortar that um, our learning environments that we seek for our students to have, our working environments that we seek for our staff to have? Well, the unrestricted general fund is required to, to support that and should. Uh, we do have other programs such as deferred maintenance, um, which again was funded differently before. And then um, in our case, the unrestricted general funds like most fund, most districts also support that. So we're talking about multiple millions of dollars to support those efforts, which is never enough, 
that's the requirement um, in the education code that the district has. We also have additional expenditures that may occur. Another program that's not fully funded by federal, state, and or uh, local control funding formula. Um, special education is one program um, that is it's not designed to be funded that way. And so with that design plan, the unrestricted general fund should be investing in programs for our students um, that have exceptional needs, and we do that. And as those needs, and as uh, just like with uh, other demographic information, those needs change, those expenditures may change. And so with that, those investments, we also see that the unrestricted general fund should make um, in that um, obligation. And so um, with that being said, those things, in addition to the inflation of, of, of different costs that are happening, that's what's driving the expenditure change. But essentially, it is a large part of it. It's, it's our staffing. Every staff increase that we've had, as well as the growing amounts that annually employees should be able to earn to, to make a, 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 a living. So I will go to the next slide. Okay, so this slide is just headlines um, of the current state. So we've talked about Oakland 2012-13 forward. Today with the pandemic, that's added an additional stressor on school district funding because this is A, something that no one was prepared for. Yes, we have received resources to be able to support not only the um, academic um, losses, but also the social emotional, not only of our students, but of our staff. But you're seeing many different districts that are facing significant district deficits that weren't in the same cycle as in Oakland, that perhaps their revenue and their attendance uh, was growing. And now, based on the pandemic, um, we're seeing that enrollment nationwide, but in California specifically, is declining. And so for many of those districts, it's accelerated more so than what we're experiencing in Oakland. And so with that, it's still declining even more, as you saw with the charts with the pandemic. But essentially, um, many of our California um, school district partners are having the same challenges. So we just wanted to point out that in this moment, this piece of the story is about uh, California schools as a whole. Okay, so I'm going to turn this slide over to Mr. Christmas uh, so he can talk about the revenue picture. And I do see some questions in the chat and I think now Jody will pause after we get through this section to get to the questions. Is that how we wanna facilitate just so Troy knows as we move forward? And we sure. have two more slides, I think in right. this section. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep, there's some questions there. I see um, Vice President Davis is answering some and I also wanna check, I, I said I would come back to interpretation Okay. Six o'clock. So if we can, Andres, if you can ask for that again, and if we don't, I know some folks are still coming on, but if we don't have anyone needing Spanish interpretation, we will let our interpreter go for the evening. But Andres, why don't we ask one more time? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Quinto. Buenas tardes. Otra vez estamos preguntando si algunas de las personas aquí presentes necesitan interpretación al español. Por favor, háganoslo saber. Ya sea pónganlo en el chat. O levanten su mano para que la señorita Miss Talkington pueda activarles la traducción. Okay, I don't see anyone who needs interpretation tonight. Thank you so much, Andre Andres. We will see you next time. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, there's some questions about seeing the graph. Um, fixed expense revenue um, and expenditures. And thank you, Vice President Davis linked some more charts. There's also a question about capital bond measures tracked and accounted for. And I know Mr. Christmas has a slide about all of our funds. So maybe you can get to that there. So I think, and uh, we will pause and um, take all questions in a Q&A. So we'll keep moving as of now. So back to, back to you both to present. All right, so um, as, First of all, good evening, Troy Christmas, um, Director of Special Projects. And right now, special projects are all around COVID and money. And so that's what I'm focused on here today in, in my daily work. Um, Ms. Grant Dawson sort of laid out the, the major issue or the major thing that is impacting the revenue side of the equation. So we're going to get to the expenditure side of the equation because ultimately revenue and expenditures have to, to balance. 
uh, and the major one is our attendance and enrollment. Uh, and But there are many things going on that we have to balance. And so this slide sort of just tries to describe what's going on as we plan for 22-23, because this all this talk about budget reductions and, and changes and adjustments is really about how do we plan for the future years to make sure that our revenue and, ex and expenditures balance. So on one side, we have uh, things that are potentially causing or causing revenue increases. So in the LCFF, there is base funding, uh, supplemental and concentration. There is an increase to concentration funding. Uh, and so that will have a tendency to pull, push our revenue higher. There's an increasing student need. And what that means is that we have more, a high, higher percentage of our students uh, that are in the group that um, bring that additional funding. So that would increase our revenue. Uh, we have additional funding directed to strategic priorities. So these are not the base funds, but these are additional funds coming in to fund particular pieces of work that uh, schools are engaged in or school districts are engaged in that Oakland is also engaged in. So community schools, educator effectiveness, they are things that we've been focused on as a district for some time. There's additional funding in those areas. And then lastly, we have a projected cost of living adjustment, which is what COLA is, uh, uh, for of 2.48%. Uh, and so those things are all pushing revenue higher. And on the opposite side, we've got the challenges that are decreasing revenue uh, at Census Day, we are 740 students below uh, our initial projection. So when we projected our budget back in June, we said, hey, this is what we are expecting. We're below that projection. So that means that the finances we projected are going to need to be adjusted as a result of that. Uh, we have significantly lower attendance rates, uh, which is what we just talked about being experienced all over California, certainly here. Uh, demographers are predicting increased number of families leaving the East Bay. Uh, and that's going to, uh, should it materialize, impact uh, enrollment, not necessarily attendance directly, but enrollment. Um, and then through COVID, we've had the state essentially holding districts static at their attendance slash enrollment rates prior to the pandemic so that you didn't have a fall off in revenue as a result of the changes in attendance from from the COVID pandemic. But that hold harmless is what they're calling it. Hold harmless on enrollment in ADA is going to come off, or at least it is planned and intended by the state to come off as we plan for the 22-23 year. And as Ms. Grand Dawson indicated, our enrollment and attendance figures, if they don't dramatically make a pop in the other direction, we'll start feeling the impact of that reduction in enrollment uh, and, and attendance in our revenue. Lisa, do you wanna take this one? Sure. So I was trying to answer questions in the chat at the same time. Okay, <laughs> so um, we when we budget, um, and as we review throughout the year, we do this in a multi-year format. So this is a slide from budget adoption. And with the um, onset of the pandemic and a lot of the one-time funds, we've been reflecting our multi-year projection with and without these resources. And why that's important is because again, we had a challenge prior to the pandemic that we needed to address. And so um, I will go back to, I think um, a slide if it's, it's in this deck, there were things that also happened when I talked about that 2018-19 year. Um, when we were uh, negotiating um, and there was a strike. And so then we were able to remedy that with a new contract. You saw us making reductions. You see an expenditure drop um, in that next year. Um, um, and in 2021, and implemented $17 million in reductions. And there was a mid-year reduction um, in 18, 19. Making reductions in that way is essentially cutting away versus reimagining and reviewing how we manage the school district. What are our priorities? What are the things that we should be investing in? Because you can only cut so long before it begins to A, either not make sense or you realize I've cut something to meet a financial goal, but now operationally we're challenged. And so in the 2021-22 budget, this first column, we um, were budgeted to receive 410 million, almost to $411 million. 
Again, this is based on the majority of this is the local control funding formula, but there are other resources, other state uh, resources and local resources. So the majority being the local control funding formula, which is approximately 398 million of that 410. The expenditures were 319, uh, almost 20 million. Now, what it makes up the expenditures, and again, this is just a summary slide. It's our salaries, it's uh, materials and supplies, it's also everything from utilities to, uh, if you've been um, watching these presentations, a lot of conversation. Um, we did a, a presentation a few months ago about, about consultants and other investments that not only the, as it's referred to, central district mates, but school sites as well. And does that come from the unrestricted or restricted resources? This other financing sources and uses, that's the area where we call contribution, that contribution to uh, ongoing major maintenance. There is no revenue for that particular resource. So again, that's where you would take 3% of the total expenditures and you would invest in um, that, area, that particular area. That only gives the district um, a little less than $20 million. That won't cover one month's payroll, but that's the same amount that we apply for our facilities and investments. And so any uh, change or challenge in those areas won't benefit us in that same way. The larger portion is um, our uh, contribution to special education, uh, which is about 70 million uh, of that number. And so with that, in this year on row E, we see that we're netting to zero. Revenue 410, and then you have to add the amount in A9 expenditures and uh, and other financing sources and uses because that is still an expense to the general fund. And so we netted to zero. Well, why? Because we knew the prior year that we needed to make a reduction of $16 million. And we, in effect, made reductions um, of a little under 20 million because we proposed $20 million in reductions, of which 16 was being funded by one-time resources. 11 million from one of our COVID resources. Um, it's uh, el elementary and secondary emergency response act funding. And then 5 million from a one-time resource the district received um, as a result of assembly bill 1840, that was 5 million. And so that 16 million is what helped us net to zero. That means that the reductions that we made um, in the unrestricted general fund using those resources, if they were to return, then 2223 would have been negative 20 million because the next year where you see the pink square, that 3.5 million, if I added 16 million back, that would have made us negative 20 million. So why do we have to make um, changes and reductions? If you look at 2223, which is the middle column, which is the budget we're preparing to present, those expenditures, you can see that there is an increase. And some of those increases are gonna be natural just because of salary increases that uh, incurred. Uh, it, it, it's gonna be a combination of, I'm an employee and I've been here 10 years and the next year, when I'm in my 11th year, I get a salary increase. Or um, in addition to that, maybe I don't have a salary increase on the salary schedule because of that, but my pension has increased, my health and um, welfare has increased. Whatever those adjustments are, or the cost of living, the cost of uh, curriculum, or the cost of other expenditures has gone up. With that, we need room. We cannot support other compensation without the room in the expenditures to do that. We cannot invest more resources in any fund, but specifically the unrestricted general fund. Why? Because it's responsible for every other fund. And so with that, what we're talking about is recalibrating the way we educate, what we're investing in, reviewing um, different programs, um, as well as departments. Um, there are a lot of uh, conversations about, well, let's um, make the adjustments in the central office. And so the district has done that. The district is continuing to look in those particular areas. And we also look at those risks of making those recommendations and where and how they'll land as it relates to our outcomes. And so there has to be room and a reduction in expenditures 
because what did we see as far as revenue? We have not since 2012, 13, showed a marginal increase that was significant enough to increase our revenue projections. So I'm gonna slide over to the last column, 2023, 24. That increase from uh, 407 to 416, that's happening because the rate is changing. The same thing I showed you on those orange slides. It's because the local control funding formula is still funding us more. There's a 3.11% COLA. So meaning a cost of living adjustment that takes your uh, prior year revenue and then it multiplies it by that factor. But in the same two years, three years, we're losing enrollment and we're losing attendance so significantly that what you're seeing in 2022, 23 as a budget projection of $408 million rounding in revenues is going to decline, why? Because now we're seeing that our enrollment projections based on actual enrollment uh, and attendance is gonna be lower. And that's what we're talking about, that net loss uh, of students from due to the pandemic. So that slide that showed you other districts are having that same challenge of the number of students that we're losing. We're going to see more of a, an impact. That means what an adopted budget we showed as a negative three and a half million is gonna grow. We're still an employer. We still have responsibilities to tend with. So we have to reimagine how we do business based on the resources that we earn so that we can make the appropriate investments um, throughout the district. And so I'll pause there and then turn, uh, I'll pause for questions. Um, Jody, are you gonna facilitate or is that uh, Director? Um, yeah, Dave? I'll, I'll, I'll um, go through the questions and thanks um, Vice President Davis who've been kind of staying in communication in the chat during the presentation too. Um, but let, if we pull out some of these, um, just a, a question here. Um, the COVID money saved our bacon, like, like that phrase, from pre-COVID shortfalls. Um, when that money, money runs out, we will have to make cuts that we didn't make pre-COVID, correct? And would you assume inflation for non-payroll and non, what did you assume inflation for payroll and non-payroll, non-pension would be? So if you could address those. Yeah. So we do have an assumption chart. It's not on this deck that um, looks at. So the average change in salary district wide um, is 1.3%. So that factors in retirement changes and employees that may be changing on a salary schedule. Um, we do, um, so School Services of California is one of the resources that we use to help again, to translate California, um, um, cost of living um, and increases or what um, we also look at is the consumer price index. And so that's approximately 1.7%. So all of those factors, yes, we do add into our assumptions. Now, again, it doesn't mean everything is increasing, but the same fuel increases we see as uh, consumers, personal consumers, the district will see that. The same cost in construction and materials, the district will see that. The same cost of replacing tires that we're seeing as consumers, the district will also experience that. So to answer your question, we do put those various factors into our assumptions about how much cost will, will increase. Okay, thank you. So inflation is running at 13%. Um, so we did not necessarily predict inflation at 13%, but if you're looking at the net change in, in a number, there may be other factors that are there. So I'm not sure which numbers you may be looking at. And I know you can see this on, um, and Vice President Davis, this might be um, even something that you can address. It says, looking at, the presentation indicates enrollment declines and budget cuts are long-term recurring phenomenon. What steps has the district taken to break out of the downward spiral of declining enrollment, leading to more budget cuts, leading to more people leaving. What sort of reimagining is taking place? I'm thinking of the enrollment stabilization policy that the board passed. Do you want to speak to that or anything other things that you're aware of at the board level? And then we can help. Yeah, us. absolutely. And it's great to have Amy as the PTA president at, at Sankofa United here because um, they are prime example of a school that really has promoted themselves in the neighborhood and 
put out signs saying, you know, proud parent of Sankofa United student. And so I think um, part of that enrollment stabilization plan is really trying to get the district to promote our schools a little better. Um, so we do have, it's a fitting day to have this, it's the first day of the enrollment period for next year. Um, so the enrollment deadline, priority deadline is February 4th. And um, this year we do have a new enrollment website and we're starting to market our schools a little bit more and, and um, asking every school to develop a plan to do some outreach to the community so that the, you know, an elementary school is connecting to the local preschools and a middle school is connecting to its feeder schools um, to try and build those connections so that people uh, know what's special about this, their neighborhood school and why, why it's a good option for them. Um, but all that said, we do also, you know, at the same time, see the reality that other school districts are also marketing themselves because as, as our charter schools, because uh, it is a competitive environment where enrollment is declining for a lot of different um, districts as people, you know, gentrification is, is having its impact on the Bay Area and uh, there's more homeschooling and so forth because of the pandemic. And so it is a, a difficult competitive enrollment environment. Thank you. And we may want to continue with the presentation. Keep putting your questions in the chat. There is an open Q&A after we get through all the slides too. So I'll pass it back to Ms. Gardasson or Mr. Christmas. One thing I did want to just add, and, and you know, maybe more minutia than most folks want to go into, but if you do look at our adopted budget where we have the MYP, there's an executive summary that lays out uh, the assumptions that Ms. Grant Dawson was talking about as of how we, what assumptions we put into our uh, projections going forward so that folks want to look at that in, in great detail, which she referred to. Great, next slide, please. Okay, Mr. Christmas, you want to kick us off? So one of the, we're going to go into um, the budgeting process next, but one thing as we're looking at sort of how we are going to address the situation is getting people's minds wrapped around the difference between one-time funding and ongoing funding. Uh, and so this is sort of saying, you know, you, you, you can't burn through your savings to pay your rent, or you can burn through your savings to pay your rent, but you're not gonna live there very long if you do that, uh, because eventually your savings is gonna be gone and the mortgage is still gonna be due the next month. Uh, and so likewise, for an organization like ours, where our principal costs are people, uh, you can burn through your savings to pay for people, but you're creating a cliff somewhere down the line where you still want the people and the savings are gone. And so whatever one-time resources we get, uh, we need to be thoughtful about how we apply those to our primary uh, costs, which are people. And so the general rule has been, uh, you spend one-time money on one-time things. Uh, that's the general rule. We certainly had exceptions as a district and, and even in a household, you have exceptions, but you create a situation uh, where you're gonna have something that's an ongoing expense and you're not gonna have ongoing resources to, to pay for it. Uh, let me go back one. So what we wanted to do here was just give a quick overview about the process we're going through. Uh, part of that reimagining process is something that um, is a part of a budget development process that has to happen on an ongoing basis. And so we're gonna go through that and, and also articulate where we are uh, in that process. And I'll go through that. The first is just starting with our budget development process. We're grounded in our priorities. So whatever reimagining or changing or adjusting we are doing, we're doing it so that we can uh, meet the outcomes we have for students. Uh, and so this is just a summary of our LCAP goals, some performance outcomes, and also strategic plan initiatives that we are focused on as we go through whatever uh, adjustments to our planning and therefore budgeting for next year and beyond next year. Uh, and so each year in 2018, the board adopted a sort of structure for um, how it would do its budgeting based on the government finance officers association sort of smarter school spending framework. This is a uh, summary of that. It's not in the exact format, uh, but the process begins with affirming the priorities within our goals. Our goals aren't changing, uh, but we are going to need to prioritize uh, within, within those goals in terms of each year or each, each series of years where we're gonna focus. And so 
what are we going to focus on in terms of ongoing? And I just gave some examples around literacy and staff compensation. What short-term priorities do we need to focus on? Uh, and those the, the ones listed there, COVID response, loan payoff, um, technology transitions, facilities improvements. These can change year to year in terms of short-term, but long-term, uh, you'll see that they, they're focused on uh, our, our long-term goals as indicated in our LCAP or strategic plan. And then second in the process of identifying the potential investments uh, to our priorities. Um, and so right now there's a process going on with uh, central office staff and, and uh, similar, but not the same going on with schools where we're bundling the areas of work that we're engaged in across departments uh, and schools, for example, enrollment stabilization work or recruitment and hiring work so that we can see how much are we spending on these different areas so that when we get to the place of prioritizing, we have an idea of sort of the scale and the scope of what we're spending in different areas so that we will have to make those trade-offs with hopefully eyes wide open. Um, what required expending adjustments are we going to need to make? So when you're doing your budgeting, uh, particularly for a school district, I, I did budgeting in the private sector. Uh, and while there may be a few different sources of few different resources, school districts have are highly regulated. There are many different resources. There are many different changes in law uh, that you have to respond to every year. Uh, and so we need to keep those uh, in mind in terms of required spending adjustments, whether they be um, uh, changes to the funding formula that Ms. Grant Dawson mentioned, or just uh, inflation that that uh, we're having to deal with that's coming our way. Uh, and then additional desired spending, sort of things that we don't have in our current budget that we want to do. Uh, and so I gave some examples there. Uh, paying off our, our loan uh, to state would be one example. Um, continuing of programs using one-time dollars. Uh, I'm sorry, continuing programs that we've been able to begin with one-time dollars, but we want to continue them beyond the expiration of those one-time dollars. Those are sort of additional desired spending. You're putting all those together so that you can get to step three on the right, which is evaluate and prioritize. Uh, and so folks are talking in the, 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 the sort of framework of reductions and understandably given the shortfall between revenue uh, and expense, but really this is a prioritization of where do we want to focus our resources so that we can, um, and then what do we need to make adjustments to in order to focus those resources? So you heard Director Davis talk about uh, compensation and the need to be able to attract and retain. So this is a people business. If we don't have quality educators on the ground with our students, we can't get any of the goals met. Uh, and so that's something that we are going to have to consistently uh, address. And, and I actually wanna pause and mention that um, contracts are negotiated every period of time, but you need to have revenue in your budget to address those changes when they occur. If you don't, then you're forced to reduce to create space for, for those changes. And that's something that we've had to struggle with as a district uh, in years past. So once we get to the, the evaluate and prioritize part, uh, we need to develop an implementation plan, uh, sort of over what time we're going to do it, what staffing is going to be re required. One of the, the challenges we've had, for example, in, uh, during the COVID is we've had all this COVID money but having money doesn't make employees materialize. You still have to go find them. They still have to be available. You still have to go through the hiring process. You have to train in many cases folks and get them up to speed before the full impact of the program that you designed can actually take place. And the last piece was the financial resources. And then lastly, this framework requires, and we should be building in as we develop this, how are we gonna evaluate uh, whether the money was well spent? So the local control accountability plan has some uh, structures and tools around that that we would be using, but even in addition to that, uh, interim steps to figure out uh, whether the money is well spent so that when we get back again to step one, we actually have some input and information and, and evaluation of what's worked and what's not worked. And you'll see in the, the chart there that we are looking, and this has been a challenge we've had because of the timing of budget development, of having stakeholder engagement at each step. Uh, and that's something that we're going to probably be working on forever, but that is definitely the intention, both in terms of what the board adopted in 2018 and in what we're trying to do uh, this year. So that's a quick overview, sort of I'm starting with step one, where we are, 
uh, is that evaluate that uh, affirming priorities, what's working and what's not working as we look to prioritize among our goals and, and uh, the priorities that would get us there, what's missing or of strategic or tactical opportunity to take advantage of. Um, and that's a process that we're going through now. And we actually are asking all stakeholders to think about what's really working. So that what do we need to double down on? Uh, and therefore, what do we need uh, space in the budget to be able to double down on that versus what is not uh, yielding the same kind of results that we would, would like to see? Uh, and then number two is what I said before was staff is going through this bundling process uh, to show their existing spending by areas of work so that we can transparently evaluate how much money is going where by type of work or type of, of, of investment uh, instead of just in what we typically see in the financial system, which is uh, salaries, uh, benefits, uh, contracts, uh, and, and, uh, and facilities type stuff. So uh, this is to try to get more strategically at what we are spending and how much is being spent in each place. Uh, and then where we hope to get to with that is um, figuring out what is it that we must do, uh, should do, nice to do, and what, what can we stop? Now, I like to pause here and I say that, that we probably have more should do's than we can afford. Like if, if I just paid for all the must do's and I looked at all the should do's, we probably have more should do's than the unrestricted general fund can support. And so we're gonna have to be prioritizing within the should do's and most of the nice to do's, frankly, uh, we're gonna need to find other resources for if we're going to do them because the unrestricted general fund can't support them. We'll see that as we go through the process. Uh, and then the question sort of uh, at the end is how do we implement, track and reevaluate the investments and the impact uh, that they're having. So that's the process that we're going through. One of the things that comes up as we're going through this process and, and we hear repeatedly is, if we're facing uh, potential budget reductions or, or reduces, reducing in spending in certain areas in order to fund priorities in other areas, what can we do to help mitigate that? Uh, and so we had, uh, these are sort of the list of things that come up repeatedly and when we would get more information about those uh, as we're always working to get more information and clarify, uh, fund balance from the last year, to what extent can we use that? Remember any fund balance that you have from last year is one-time money. It's not ongoing money. It is something that's sitting there once. So once you spend it, it's gone. Same thing is true about the one-time uh, COVID resources. Um, and so we can talk about that more if there are questions, but that's a one-time resource that is relatively flexible, but once you use it, it's gone. It doesn't, it doesn't solve any uh, long-term problems, at least as it relates to ongoing uh, position. Vacancy savings. So every year, we do our budget and say, okay, we're going to hire 500 folks. Uh, and sometimes we're lucky enough to eventually hire all 500, but never have we had all 500 uh, hired and working on day one. So there's always some savings that occur when you hire somebody you thought you're gonna have in July, but you hire them in October. And so, but that all gets all gets addressed in terms of where we are relative to what we projected at our interim reports. So the first time that will come up for us uh, regarding vacancy savings will be during our first interim, which is coming December 15th. Um, restricted dollars eligible for one time or ongoing expenses, same thing that'll show up in our interim reports. We'll see where we are with the spending in those restricted dollars, what's available and not available. And then the biggest change, frankly, for our budget for 22-23 comes with the governors saying in January, here's what I am projecting for the budget uh, for the following year. And so while we have projections about what coal is going to be and we have all kinds of other information, it's preliminary and, and, until it's final. And, and the first step of getting it finalized is the, the governor's January budget. Uh, and so these are the things that are going to be at play through the entire process. Some of the information we know now, some of it we'll know soon, some of it we'll know a little bit later and want to just sort of give people uh, a clearer picture of, of what that is. All of this is the moving parts we deal with every year, except for the COVID stuff. Uh, and so because we deal with these moving parts every year, the best thing we can do is to, to have a clear set of spending priorities so that we can make adjustments when we get new information. And Ms. Grant Dawson, I saw you come off mute briefly. I did. Yeah, I did. 
So I think the other thing that we're we're doing is also we spent the last year, um, maybe four, 14 months going back. So Mr. Raphael's question, we've gone back historically because, you know, as a community, I think there's been a lot of different moving parts over time that the messaging um, gets confusing, it's, you know, major stressors, and we don't all hear the, the same um, thing. Um, and so one of the things looking back, not only historically, but where we are today is that we've been on this trajectory. And so, um, as Mr. Raphael pointed out, and several other sessions that we're in, you know, so many community members remember and recall there was this, there was either confusion or questions, and maybe those questions didn't get answered. And so that's why we've taken some steps. So Ms. Talkington and Mr. Christmas say, no, we went over that before. So when I've you know met with them, it's perhaps it was the way. And maybe in that moment, because of what was happening, there are often times um, that is hard to be heard, um, especially when they're in moments of crisis. And we've had these moments of crisis where there's so many things that are happening, we're not all moving with the same um, um, ear or trajectory. So when we talk about how what might we mitigate these things, um, there's a question about the consultants and comparing to similar districts. So one key thing that's important and something um, that I've, I've learned, I've been here just over a year and a half, is there is a the district's philosophy about how it's fun, how it funds schools is its philosophy. My statements to the district and building the evidence is, but you can't afford that model long term. It doesn't mean you can't have small schools. It doesn't mean that you can't provide more resources to schools. But the other side of that is, it is also how many schools we operate we don't have the resources to continue with that consistency and take care of all of the components over time. So yes, we can make reductions to central, reductions to consultants, which uh, again, in October, we shared uh, a, a link and we can put that link to a consultant dashboard. Um, Mr. Christmas will put it in. That compares the last several years, central versus site, consultants, you see the name, you see the historical investment. And so the question is, and what we reviewed is, well, again, what are those uh, must have, should haves, and nice to have, and where can we make adjustments over time? But you can only do that so long, because again, the majority of our business is people. And being able to recalibrate, and I think there was a question, what do we mean by reimagining? What we mean by reimagining is we do have to look at how much we're operating and how much we're anticipating and expecting for the support staff to, to, to support um, over time. We looked at enrollment. We've not made um, reductions in perpetuity to enrollment they've been a mathematical number of how much we need to cut. Not, we've seen a decline here, we need to make these adjustments. And so in addition to that, not being able to what we do what we need to do in compensation as well, right? Creates tension um, because these are our community members as well. And so when we're asking those questions, we're looking at all of those things. Um, the contractor dashboard is in the, um, chat so you can go in and play with it to see one of the reasons why we also shared this was to show well, what are we investing in central and school sites and you'll see that a lot of those investments aside from the we you know we have to pay it's specifically consultants so you're not going to see utilities and you're not going to see water but you're going to see a lot of community organizations that support our schools you're going to see a lot of investments um, in many different areas so when we're doing that, one of the strains, it is how many different um, uh, uh, programs and school sites that we have open, which we know is a tension point. We also want to be able to have that conversation back to you heard us say, eyes wide open, and here's all the information so that when the board and the community make those decisions, that they're making the decisions not based on what we think we know, but what we know and the data to support it. Um, and so I hope, um, Mr. Raphael, that answers some of your questions as far as 
we've kind of revisited many di different major subject areas. Um, I think you had another question. You know, I'll let uh, Director Davis respond to the resolution about school closures off the table um, um, as it relates um, to that. But uh, I'll just say general, um, generally, I mean, there is a process for um, the district has gone through various iterations of what it was going to do. And then there's been changes that have been made. And then we adjust to those changes accordingly as um, the board um, votes. But of course, the staff is recommending a route and a position strategically, and then it's still the board's option on the way that they um, decide to, to move in that direction. So I'll pause there um, on that, a whole bunch more that we can share, but I know our time is getting really close. And I'll just throw in there, Lisa, yeah, it's you're absolutely right that, um, so the board did vote this year to postpone the school closures or to, to take the school closures off the table for this year. But that is unfortunately, I think with the decline in enrollment that we're seeing, it's not something that's off the table for future years. Um, so, you know, it wouldn't be something that would happen in this cycle, but it, it, it's definitely something that could be on the agenda um, next spring or next fall um, for the following year, right? So that's, that's definitely a, a consideration because we are seeing this decline in enrollment. Um, the other thing I will say is, oh, just in terms of the size of central office, that's definitely been a concern in the past. And I believe that um, Lisa and Troy are working on some more analysis of that to bring uh, to future meetings. And, and we're gonna go through you know, what, the, what the next cycle of this is, because that's definitely part of the discussion that's been going on. So I just saw another question. Uh, oh, there's, you, want to get, oh, you want to get the question first? There seems to be a disconnect between the county fiscal examiner. Uh, that's confusing to many of us. Um, so we would concur um, that there is levels of confusion, which we're uh, definitely trying to get clear. Um, so just to kind of review that process, um, each year, whether we, we have minimally four uh, financial statements. We have our adopted budget, a first interim, which is the first quarter of the year review of since adopted budget, what has changed. And that um, is usually presented in December. Then we have a second interim, which is since uh, the first interim was changed or been amended, and we present that in March. And then we have an unaudited actuals, which is, well, what happened um, with the actuals for the year? How much revenue did we actually get? How much did we actually spend? And how close were we to the projections that we provided in adopted budget first or second interim report? The district has over the past 20 years, um, it's really 20 plus, but I'll keep it at 20, been qualified, meaning it means that the district is unsure of whether it's able to meet its current or next two year financial obligations. So that multi-year projection, there's consistent deficits. So the slide, can you go back to the slide with the multi-year? The slide that we showed that um, has a, a negative number. So the county, as well as the district is watching that, hey, how much are we negative? And then how much do we need in order to make back to the cut, the reduction versus, okay, let's we look at how we're investing and we're spending and where are our gaps? Because you can, again, only cut so much without really getting to recalibrating um, your core programs and your core efforts. So what they're seeing from the multi-year, which is this, the multi-year that we show there is one that shows with the COVID resources and especially with the restricted, it looks worse just because there's one-time money coming in and going out. But um, the long and short is that the cohort three decision was a trigger. The, and that's what triggered what is a a new energy, the board had, the district has been qualified again for approximately 18 of the 20 years. I think I was looking at a historical file and in 2016, 17, 15, 16, that was the first time the district had not certified as qualified and the county did not um, amend um, its, its certification. So to answer your question, the county is concerned about the district 
going into fiscal distress. And because more recently in 1617, um, when we saw, uh, it's not on this slide, but it's on the full deck where our revenue, our expenditures were exceeding our revenue and our fund balance, which you're seeing now is 70 plus million in the unrestricted general fund was 4 million. That was concerning. And so their concern is that without the district making reductions and decisions timely that will enter into another phase of distress where we are on the eve of uh, paying off the first initial state loan one in 2023 and then the second one in 2026. So I hope that gives context as to what they're looking at and what their concerns are. What we disagree with is Again, we've been here and we have made improvements and we are making those steps and we are communicating with the board and we are impressing upon the board to make various decisions of which they've recently done. So um, we can spend more time on that, but that's essentially what's being said. And so when we get a letter for each financial report, we also, the, the county sends us a letter and we respond to that letter. And so um, we responded to the county letter um, in October. Um, and then uh, we have recently received an approval where initially we had a conditional approval. Now the county has approved our budget and you're seeing the budget, uh, part of the budget here. And, but then they have various concerns that they've articulated. So I hope that gives some summary as far as where, where we are with that. And I think there'll be more conversation about that at the board meeting on Wednesday. So Jody, I'll yield the floor back to you. Or wait, do we have another slide? <laughs> I forgot, we got off on the... There we go. So we'll, we'll get to that slide. So I actually am skipping a slide here till we can get to the, the Q&A more, more deeply. The slide that I was skipping was just saying that, that we have trade-offs when, when, when some costs are going up, some other things need to go down in order to make, uh, make space. I hear a lot of the energy around sort of where is the money being spent now? And so we've started some analyses about that uh, to share. One was the consultant one that I shared in the chat that I'll mention here uh, as well. Um, but what uh, Lisa articulated before was that we have multiple different funds, but we're normally talking about this general fund on the far left. So we have specific resources that are dedicated to adult ed, early childhood, our cafeteria funds, facilities, self-insurance fund uh, to pay for all the things that we self-insure ourselves for. Um, but most of what we are focusing on is the general fund. The general fund can be split into unrestricted and restricted. And the lion's share of what all of our base programming has to come out of is this unrestricted number. And that's where our focus is. You can see that the restricted number is actually larger in 21, 22, but that's really mostly COVID, <laughs> that, that it's larger. It's not normally larger. It's, it's getting more comparable, but it's not normally larger. Uh, on the unrestricted side, you have sort of general purpose dollars on the far left yellow box which is basic staffing for schools and, and, and central office and sort of some examples there. Supplemental and concentration, which we have some flexibility on spending, but that there are outcomes that we're being watched for improved services to specific groups of students as it relates to this money. And so as we spend it, we need to also be documenting how we are improving the services to those groups of students, English language learners, low income and foster youth. And so below that, the second bullet is some examples. And then we get other money that is, is flexible in spending in terms of state lottery or uh, home and hospital money that's very directed in terms of what its, uh, what its intended purpose is. Um, and so what most of our conversation has been about and, and in terms of adjustments that need to be made, most of it is in the unrestricted side. And I just wanted to make a note for those who are nerds like me and who track uh, this number says 314.6. Earlier in the presentation, you saw a number that said 319.6. This is a sort of thing about how we have to report to the county and the state. We transfer, and I think Ms. Grand Dawson mentioned this, we contribute to other programs, and then we also transfer out of the general fund into other funds. 
And so there was a $5 million transfer out of the general fund into one of the other funds. That That's the discrepancy there between 319 and 314, but it's, uh, and that's just based on the way we have to report in different places. Um, I already said that adjustments may need to come from largely from uh, unrestricted funds. Um, here, regarding the consultants, uh, if you go and look at the analysis, which is also linked here, you can see a lot more detail. But as Ms. Grant Dawson mentioned, we've been making changes in this area over time. So in 2018-19, uh, these expenditures were 6.3% of our total expenditures. It's down to 5.2. In addition to that, you can see the proportion of it that is coming from unrestricted dollars is also shrinking. Uh, and so we have been making adjustments there, but the total amount there that's in unrestricted now is $7.4 million. So we were just to eliminate all unrestricted spending on co contractors uh, of any type, including what was in the chat, the register of voters, that still would only generate uh, $7.4 uh, million. And again, you can look at the analysis to go into more detail. It lists all the consultants from the top to the bottom uh, that we spent both from school sites and central departments. Uh, and then uh, we are, do you want to take this one, Lisa? Because I know I can take it, but I want to make sure if you want to take it. Go ahead, I'll back All up. right, so uh, <laughs> here we're just trying to give another window into how the unrestricted general fund is currently being spent. And so you see the different slices uh, of the pie, central office being 108, elementary, middle and high, sort of where that is. Uh, roughly um, two thirds going to schools or two thirds going to schools and a third going to central office. And so as we're looking at uh, this, we need to look at what are the what are the purposes of that money, both at the schools uh, and at central office? And how are we thinking about prioritizing those as we go forward? And so this whole concept of, of reimagining that we've been that we've been talking about, as well, you'll get a certain idea of on the next slide, um, that 108 million in central office goes to many different things. And so this is an example of how that splits out by department. Uh, and so department doesn't tell you exactly what service is being provided, but you'll see that we've got student assignment, academic innovation, community schools, uh, lots of departments, counseling, Office of Equity, Oakland Athletic League, many of these are direct services to schools or in some cases, direct services uh, to individual students. And so, but this is just so that you can have um, some transparency around where that money is currently being spent in departments. And the other thing I'll say is that this is where that bundling work that you heard about going on, where we're taking, okay, here are the dollars in these departments, what are the individual uh, areas of work that those dollars are being spent on. Uh, and so, but this is to give you, give you an idea of where, where the money is. If we were going to make reductions, where would they come from? Uh, at least as it relates to central office, this is, this is where it is. Uh, right, and then on the- Add something to that yeah. before we move off of it. So one of the things when we're having that consideration and why we're sharing this information and, you know, essentially it's, you know, and asking the question and here's the information, the process we will go through of even looking at these different departments and we hear, you know, uh, sharing about what the central office or why does the central office manage this, you know, school sites should, you know, do that. Every school site that we have, when it makes a decision, it impacts how does that service get to you? because we are an, an organization with one tax ID number. And so if a school site makes a decision about its bill schedule, it impacts transportation. That's all districts. But if a school site says, well, I'd like to buy, and this is one of um, our other challenges, I'd like to buy this from this place. I'd like to buy this from this place. I'd like this service from this place. Coordinating those pieces and how that may impact support departments becomes a direct interface to how that is manifested. And so depending on what adjustments are made to the central office, there would be things. And when we say trade-offs, there will also be things that we would or may have to say, and so we can't support this in this way. If there's multiple streams of software that one central department, central um, technology department has to support, 
then we have to be able to manage that. Otherwise, we won't be able to meet expectations um, as it relates to software upgrades uh, and other challenges and, and management therein. So just to give a couple of examples of what um, some of the exercises you know, are and would be when we're looking at the district in totality. It is not as simple as just saying, uh, let's just make reductions to um, these departments because it's then what's the impact to the school sites that do not manage it, we, we don't expect them to begin to manage their own payroll, begin to manage risk management. Uh, they do have some levels of human resource services, but not uh, other central resource services. We wouldn't adjust uh, transportation, but we can look at how we can make things more efficient so that we're able to potentially spend less in transportation, but we wouldn't be able to cut or eliminate it. And so with that, just wanted to give you that line of sight. So as you're looking at these, there's a lot of thoughtfulness and strategic discussion that has to happen behind the, the purpose. And also many of these areas were overtime requests. They were also adaptations to support community school modeling. So that's why it's not as simple if you go back to the pie chart. Oh, well, let's just take half of what's uh, in central and then it solves our problem or a quarter of it and it solves our problem. We do still have to look at the infrastructure that we've established that we'd like and to see where we can further lean um, in answering um, that question. So with that being said, I'll turn it back over to Troy to go back to the last slide. All right, I'm just gonna go through these a uh, couple of quickly. So on the site side, on the school site side, there's links to the, the examples for 21-22 about how the funding profile uh, showed up for each individual school. But we have school site budgets that are based on formulas. Those formulas are largely based on the student need, based on grade span, unduplicated pupil count, which is really uh, related to the uh, ELL status, uh, language learning status, foster youth, and um, free and reduced price lunch uh, status of our students. That's how the primary funding uh, is allocated to our different schools. And then we have additional funding that is also on these, uh, these links. So you can go ahead and see how it's allocated to each school. Um, covered that. Uh, we have some funds that are targeted or restricted that are based on the student needs or specific target student groups. Uh, and those, those individual pages will show some of that. Uh, and some of them are provided directly at the school and some of those services, additional services are provided centrally in some of those departments. So you saw community schools uh, as one of those larger in dollar amounts, central office departments. Well, a lot of those targeted services are coming from uh, that department. And I think I will stop there. Um, Jody, I don't know if you want to say anything about the timeline. We're, we're continuing with engagements until we get to some final decision making that needs to be done uh, in January. Correct. Or Sam, do you want to start and I can add in? And sure. Then... Yeah. Okay. Um, so just want to really appreciate Troy and Lisa for, for just diving into all this. I know it's a lot of information and I know they're working really hard right now at, at looking at how to, you know, do some reorganizing in central office um, to try and, you know, figure out where, where adjustments can be made and how we can um, you know, control the impact to school sites. And so looking forward, you know, there's, there's just to give you guys a, a sense of what's coming up, um, after the break, there's going to be a budget and finance committee, which will preview you know, the first interim report, which will really give us some hard numbers in terms of how much do we have left in one-time resources and how much do we have in the fund balance and how much do we save for vacancy savings? And, and so what does that mean in terms of what is the, the size of, of reductions that need to be made for next year and how much can they be cushioned or not cushioned by um, the one-time funds? And then there's gonna be an engagement the week after that, uh, similar to this one, but in a different district. And um, then after the holidays, uh, in January, so the first meeting of January on January 12th, we're going to get really the, the hard details about what we're looking at for next year in terms of uh, budget reductions. And there's going to be an engagement with the, the Parent Student Advisory Council uh, the, the night after that on January 13th. 
and then a final vote on budget adjustments at the end of January. Um, so, you know, it's it's definitely not going to be an easy discussion, but I do appreciate just the transparency that Lisa and her staff bring, um, and it does allow for a lot more um, clarity about what's going on and why. And I just will close by saying before we go to, to Q&A, you know, it really, um, I just want to bring it back to that bigger picture of the state of California. We're not the only district that's having serious enrollment declines. We saw a 6% decline in LA, a, a similar 3% decline in enrollment in San Francisco. And so it's really concerning because it is this abandoning of public education that we're seeing across the state. And that's similar to this uh, um, disinvestment from public education that we, that we see in California. And so we really need to advocate that the state does provide as, as many resources as possible for our schools, for our students, and to, uh, to double down on our commitment to our students and to mitigate all of these uh, difficult situations that we're seeing with, with lack of funding for education. But with that, I do wanna give some time for Q&A. So I will hand it back over to Jody for, um, for facilitating that. Great, thank you. And we can take down the projection, I think. At this point, we can see more faces. I believe we addressed a lot of the questions in the chat already. So continue if you prefer um, to write out your question to use the chat and I'll track it and read them out loud. And I believe, well, in our two minutes left, we could probably go over a little bit. If there's anybody who wants to raise their hand, we can take a couple um, out loud questions as well. I see Mr. Harrison, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, uh, I have a quick question, Rich Harrison. I'm the CEO for Lighthouse Community Public Schools and I just really appreciated this presentation. It was really well done. I just had a quick question. We're uh, gonna have to, as a charter school, align to uh, the, the vaccination policy uh, and the exemptions and all that. And I was just wondering if you all have like estimated if uh, there are any increased costs on being able to implement that vaccine program and then giving some of the kind of the consequences of let's say if they don't get their exemptions done, do you see like, uh, have you guys adjusted for any like enrollment gaps that you may have given from the fallout from the, you know, execution of that by second semester. So we are working through those projections okay. now. Um, and so to your point, yes, there is a projected, even where we are now with enrollment, uh, what gap is that that we may experience? Um, and that's all schools, um, as, you're, as you're pointing out. And then it is the cost of the vaccination, which we have specifically uh, as I'm, I'm sure you're looking to, to have done too, is using our one-time resources to pay for that. The question becomes, and now that we have the vaccination for younger children, if parents offer that, that helps us to offset costs that um, we would have incurred, but it's still going to be a cost. And currently the resources are projected to last until 23-24. Uh, so to your point, depending on how long the pandemic and its tenants last for PPE and other things, we all may be incurring more resources that, though we just had an infrastructure bill that passed, did not specifically cover any additional pandemic and COVID resources. So yeah, so I hope that helps answer your question. We're in the same process of uh, estimating that as well. Time for a couple more. <laughs> Anybody else like to ask a question out loud or type in the chat, anything lingering, any comment or question? Oh, I do see one question from, where did I go, Miss? Just, do I start pronounce it right? Is it Stice or Steeth? <clears throat> Stice. It is nice. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so currently, there's a lot of lobbying and legislation for another year of what was framed initially for 2020-21 of home, hold harmless against the ADA loss. So currently, we are projecting for 22-23 that that drop that I was sharing that was, is really going to be the ADA for 21-22 is how we're going to build 22-23. And so a hold harmless would keep us at a flat rate, the rate we're using now, which is technically 1920s ADA. 
because we've had a couple of years of um, being able to use a prior, prior year ADA, not only because the education code provides it, but because of the pandemic, there was a year to bridge that gap. So that's a, a significant legislation um, item that many school districts all are uh, requesting um, a hold harmless so that therefore the state somehow can make up for that cliff, the gap that we're all trying to um, mediate. I presume if one of our local legislators wasn't in support of that, we would have a mechanism to hear about it and raise hell. <laughs> I anticipate, yes, ma'am. So <laughs> I mean, anticipate. I mean, anticipate and react appropriately. I've not in heard a dignified manner. Yeah, I've not heard anyone that isn't. I think, of course, as we're looking at the sum of all parts, um, that's where the challenge is. Um, how will this fail? Oh, did she freeze? Yeah, I think we lost her for a bit. Oh, no. Um, I'll just chime in and say, you know, I think overall it's also that I think the governor and a lot of legislators get very excited about like some specific program that's going to be, you know, a one time funding for this or one time funding for that. And as we've kind of been trying to bring home, it's really the one time funding that it doesn't help us with our ongoing um, expenses as much as it might. And so really encouraging the legislature just to double down on LCFF and just increase that for all districts um, so that we can meet the needs, the basic needs that we have. And I think the other piece there is, you know, we still are waiting the way the, the scenario plays out every year. It's like the governor puts out his budget and then we all kind of respond to it. So I think we're all sort of waiting for, okay, what's going to come in January and then there'll be a lot of response. So the picture should be clearer after that. Okay, maybe one last question before we have Vice President Davis close us out. Is there one last question or comment? All right, thank you everybody. Vice President Davis, you wanna close us out? Yeah, it's a quiet group, um, but I really appreciate people tuning in and listening and, and getting educated. And I hope the resources were, were helpful and really uh, very grateful to Ms. Grant Dawson and Mr. Christmas for, uh, and Ms. Talkington and Ms. Stice for um, helping with this evening. Um, and just please stay engaged, go back to your schools. You know, we're, we're gonna be doing engagements as I think the, the parent student, uh, I see Ms. Kershid from Parent Student Advisory Council here, and you know, there's going to be a lot of discussion with them. And I think our school site councils play a really important role in deciding how to allocate these resources at the school sites. And uh, I hope we can, um, again, just emphasize it's if we all can talk about equity and anti-racist practice, and the most anti-racist thing I think we can do is is to advocate for. Uh, our schools to get funded so that uh, students of greatest need are getting the resources they need to, to get educated. So um, let's let's continue to advocate and, and I thank you all for participating. Good night, everybody. <laughs>